to Miguel A. Santana. I'm going to introduce him. And he fortunately has been willing to come a little early. Uh, so you'll see him on the agenda as the third speaker this morning, but we're moving him into the second spot. And Miguel is a someone who has been around county and city politics and bureaucracy almost his whole career. And he has a lot of key insight on how things work, how they could work, uh, and he's going to bring that to bear here in his conversation with us. But right now, his position is as CEO of the Fairplex, which is, as you know, it's in Pomona. It's the largest county fair in all of America. So that's a big job. Uh, but before he was at the Fairplex, which is kind of fairly new, he was the city administrative officer for the city of LA. So if you know the city and how it operates, you know what a big lift that is. And he had that job since 2009. He reported directly to the mayor. And as CAO, his office directed oversight of the city's $9 billion budget. That's billion with a B. Uh, and in 2015, he started working earnestly on homelessness. He released a 21-page report talking about homelessness in the city of LA. And then in 2017, he was appointed to chair the commission. It's called HHH. And it's directing funds and programs around homelessness services in the city of LA. And while he's had that position, I, as executive director for NAMI Los Angeles County Council, presented to him and the HHH Commission on the really uh, important feature that board and cares play in the continuum of care and housing options for our loved ones, people living with mental illness. And so I know his team is paying particular attention to that. Uh, and uh, he's always worked on homelessness and veterans issues since then. And he has 25 plus years of experience managing obviously fiscal and programmatic elements. Uh, he sits on a variety of boards of directors for educational and civic minded organizations. Uh, and I will say one more thing is he served as uh, one of five deputy CEOs, uh, chief executive officers for Los Angeles County. So that's where his county experience comes in too. Please give a warm welcome to Miguel A. Santana to talk about him. Good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. It's a real pleasure to be with all of you. I'm gonna share a little bit about my work in homelessness, and it, and it dates back to the fall of 1987, uh, where I first met someone called Laura. It was my first year of college at Whittier College, and I, because I was recruited by a senior to volunteer at a rotating homeless shelter in the city of Whittier. It was put together by all the churches and synagogues of the Whittier community. And during the winter months, they hosted the residents of Whittier who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, they rotated because they were concerned that the neighborhood would object if they placed a permanent shelter in that facility. So just when people started thinking, something strange is going on here with all these people at this church, they would move on to another church. I was recruited to uh, volunteer uh, during my freshman year. And that meant that we set up the, the mats on the floor, and it was at, I still remember the first place, it was at a Quaker church in Uptown. If you know what here, you know what that is. Uh, we set up the mats and prepared the food and welcomed people in. There were about 30 people who came that night. There were mainly white men. There was one Latino family that had two young children, a few women, and then Laura, who I'll talk about later. She was a short, stocky woman with a bob. She carried a lot of bags with her and kept her herself, but occasionally you would see her mumble uh, to what appeared to be someone standing next to her. As a volunteer, I knew that I committed to spend the night there, so I did. And I thought, you know, I'll pull an all-nighter and get some work done. But about two o'clock in the morning, I was pretty tired, so I pulled out a cop, uh, mat myself and, and slept with the rest of the people there. Over the course of the last, those four years, I became a regular volunteer. In fact, I became the coordinator of that program. 
And it, it was through that work that I first saw the real impact of homelessness and the real stories and people behind them. Many of the people there suffered, suffered from addiction and alcoholism. Many suffered uh, from mental illness. Many had lost their jobs due to their, their, their trying to manage their addiction or their mental illness and then ultimately got evicted from their homes. Many received public assistance or some of them were actually working. It was about my third year that I was walking through Uptown Whittier and I ran into Laura again, who by then I had seen multiple times. Uh, she had seen me, but we never really engaged in the conversation. And I decided to say hello. And she responded back. And for the first time, she and I actually had a conversation. And she told me that we actually had something in common. And I asked her, what is that? And she said, you know, I graduated from Whittier College. Mm -hmm. And I said, really? And she said she graduated in 1968. She was an English major. And, um, and then told me, you know, a little bit about how she ended up where she's at. Later that day, I went to our library at the college and went up to all the yearbooks, pulled out the 1968, and sure enough, there she was. 20 years later, I was deputy CEO for the county of Los Angeles. And it was a time where the county was trying to figure out how do you manage this very difficult issue. Our, so it was an unprecedented investment of $100 million to address different, to establish different models to, to explore ways to address homelessness from a public policy standpoint. And I was fortunate enough that my responsibility was to oversee that investment. One of the models that we used was a project named Project 50. Project 50 was created to test an idea. And that idea is, is that people who are experiencing homelessness didn't get there uh, overnight. And in fact, those who are chronic, who usually have multiple issues that they're dealing with, can't really begin to manage those issues if they're homeless. Because when you're homeless, the number one thing you're working on is survival. It's protecting your safety, it's what you're gonna eat, it's coping with the very fact that you are homeless. And so Project 50 tested this Housing First model. Housing First is this notion that before we ask you to get sober or to get mental health treatment, or to receive any kind of, uh, see a doctor, that we're gonna make a commitment to house you first. And then while you're housed, then you're in a better position to deal with some of the issues that contributed to you being homeless in the first place. And so I had the responsibility, you know, of ensuring that Project 50 move forward. We were also testing what would it take to really focus on making this happen? And so we did it by practicing this program in the toughest area, Skid Row. We did a survey and identified the 50 most chronic, most vulnerable, most likely to die individuals in Skid Row and included them in the program. We we're gonna go after the hardest cases, not the easiest cases. The number one person on that list was named Mr. Livingston. Mr. Livingston had been homeless for most of his adult life. He came to Los Angeles in his early 20s from Louisiana. Um, he was a veteran. He had checked off every single box mental illness, addiction. He had multiple issues physically that he had ignored for years. And that made him our number one person. 
And so what we were trying to test is how do you get somebody who's been homeless for most of their life in Skid Row and encourage them to move inside, first and foremost. We were very fortunate that we had an army of very compassionate social workers for the Department of Mental Health. And one was assigned to work directly with Mr. Livingston. So every day she would talk to him, get to know him. First had to establish that indeed his name was Mr. Livingston. And then over time, build enough relationship with him where she proposed the idea that maybe he should consider moving inside. Huh. Now, government is very complicated. And our safety net is designed with this idea that you as an individual, if you need help, it is up to you to figure out how to navigate through it. We, we design government for the convenience of government, not for the convenience of people. I see a lot of nodding heads, okay? So when you apply, when you seek help to any program, what's the first thing you get asked for? You get asked for your name, okay? Then you get asked to prove that you are who you say you are. So it assumes that you have ID, right? Then it, it asks for your address. <laughs> then it asks for your social security number. And then once you get through all of that, if it's a program designed for the indigent or for the people with low resources, you actually have to prove that you're poor, that you can't afford these programs. So Mr. Livingston didn't have an ID. He didn't have an address. He didn't have a source of income. And so we had to learn how to put all those goals aside and serve him. We personally had to call his home city of New Orleans and talk to the registrar to get his birth certificate, which was a hard thing to do. And we had to create a, pro a system that was designed around him, not designed around us. So that took just, just the logistics of helping someone like Mr. Livingston, Livingston after he said, okay, I'm willing to get help. Took about three months. So the day finally came when we did all of that and Mr. Livingston was ready to move in. And so he was brought to his apartment and he waited and he asked one simple question. He asked, who else has a key to this apartment? And we reassured him that he was the only one with a key. He didn't believe us. And so he left. Okay. So then our social worker went back and said, Let's try this again. And after a week, she brought him back. The locks were replaced in front of him. He opened up the package, replaced the locks, took out the two keys and handed it to him and said, you are the only one with the keys. You, we could show you now. And he stayed there for the first time in 30 years. Now, Mr. Livingston's story is, is, is hard because you all know more than anybody that it doesn't, it, there's no like rainbow and perfect ending to these issues. That it's, there were days he would stay inside and days that he would stay outside. And over time, more days he stayed inside and less days outside. And then eventually he started receiving treatment that took time. And over a period of six months, we noticed that he was, he was staying inside most of the time. Now, the, the thing that we were able to do, because we were government, we were able to track in all the different ways that we had touched Mr. Livingston's life for as far back as we could go. 
And Mr. Livingston had been in jail many, many times, been arrested 